Hey everyone, before we get started with this week's show, I have a little announcement regarding the giveaway I mentioned at the end of the bonus episode last week. If you missed the bonus episode with Dan, definitely go take a listen, but here it is again. I am going to be raffling off a signed copy of Dr. Jonathan Howard's book, Cognitive Errors and Diagnostic Mistakes, A Case-Based Guide to Critical Thinking in Medicine. It's a really good book. It's very funny. It's lighthearted. It's fantastic. And it's signed by him. So how can you enter the raffle? All you have to do is leave a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you can leave a review or simply by sharing the podcast on social media or anywhere online between now and April 5th. Any shares between March 22nd and April 5th count. The winner will be announced during the episode that is released that following week between April 8th or April 9th, you know, time zones, my schedule that whole thing. Since my initial announcement, listeners have been asking some really good questions, and I want to just make some clarifications and adjustments. Jenny in the UK asked a really good question, if people outside the US can participate. And yes, of course, I will definitely mail you a book outside the US within reason. If you live on a remote island in the Antarctic, I really do appreciate you sharing the podcast with the penguins, but I can't work miracles. This is also partly why I will be setting up a Patreon in the near future so that I can do more cool stuff like this and cover some shipping costs. Maybe I'll be able to mail stuff to Antarctica someday. Who knows? Dream big, right? The second thing is, how do I know that you shared it? Good question. With reviews, I get a nice little notification. But sharing is much harder, especially if you're doing it in places that I can't reach, which is really where I want you to be sharing it. Places like Reddit or Facebook groups for nurses or medics or PAs or your town, whomever. Those places I can't see and I don't get notifications that the podcast was shared or I don't know who you are. So all you have to do is just take a screenshot that you shared it. doesn't have to have any other information of like what the group is or who they are. And then just direct message me on social media or email me at antidotespodcast at gmail.com. That way I know that you shared it, you get credit, and you go into my little Google Sheets where I will be picking a random number from. Every single time you share counts for an entry. So the more you share, the more times you get entered. Just make sure I know about it before midnight on April 5th. And that's midnight Eastern Standard Time because I'm here on the East Coast. What doesn't count? Telling someone in person like your mom. I do really appreciate that. That's really beneficial. And please do that in general. But for the sake of this raffle and giveaway, it doesn't really count. It does count if she ends up tweeting about it. Then please do take a screenshot of that and send it to me. And then your mom gets entered (laughs) and maybe she'll share the book with you. Okay, time for some more anecdotes and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey everyone, welcome to another week of Antidote Stories in Medicine. This is Christine. This week we are going to be talking about something that freaks a lot of people out in not just emergency medicine, but medicine overall, and that is labor and delivery. And I have made quite a few jokes, and they are not actual jokes, it's very true that I don't do L&D, I don't do pregnancy, babies are cute, sure, but it's not my jam. So This week, we are going to be talking with a midwife about that whole thing that even I am kind of afraid of because I'm just not super comfortable with it, and many providers are not. This week, to talk to us about midwifery and EMS and teaching military providers about labor delivery and those tiny little babies is the dubbed combat midwife, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. How you doing? Hello. How are you? It has been quite an ordeal to get this recording done. So thank you for putting up with me and everything that goes into podcasting. Really, you are sweet because I shouldn't touch anything that plugs into the wall. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you wrote an article for EMS World because you're a paramedic as well. Correct. And I was reading this article and you were talking about the different types of midwives. And I think that that's one, a lot of people don't even know what a midwife is, but that there are different types of them. So explain what type of midwife you are and just kind of the different variations that there are out there. Absolutely. So yes, I am a paramedic and a certified professional midwife. There are three different types of midwives in the United States because why not make it complicated? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So there are nurse midwives who have gone back to school after gaining their RN and get a master's degree based in midwifery. So very similar to 
a nurse practitioner's route Mm -hmm. or a nurse anesthetist where basically they have a background in nursing, but they're going to specialize in something awesome. And they chose midwifery. And then there's also a CM, which is a certified midwife, which I think is actually really amazing. And my hypothesis is, is that that's going to be the new norm uh, and really kind of take over in the future. It's in its infancy in certification. So which seems appropriate for the the role. I, I thought so too. I, I kind of <laughs> coined that phrase. Uh, and so they're only able to practice. Well, it's a still a national certificate and certification part of me. It's they're only allowed to practice in a few different states. I believe there's about seven of them and they have a medical background in something else, but decided to go back to school. So they don't have a medical background in nursing, but they maybe were like a respiratory therapist or goodness gracious. I can't think of anything else, but they have a, they have a degree, a bachelor's degree in something else medical, and then decided to go back to school and want to become a midwife. Okay. And then there's a certified professional midwife, which is what I am. And you don't have to have a medical background. I, I did have a very strong medical background and I just didn't have time to dedicate to moving away and going to school because I have been working for the military for such a long time that I really didn't want to get, give that up. And so I did a distance learning program and then you go and do your internship with someone. There's actually a few different ways. You could actually go away and go to school to get your CPM as well. Bastyr University is a phenomenal example of that. And um, that's in the Washington area. Um, they have a, a brilliant program. Um, so that's just one example of three different ways to be able to hang out with women during their childbearing years that are a conglomerate of either high risk or low risk moms that would like to have a more natural outlook on birth and pregnancy and womanhood. Whereas the medical model of care tends to focus on birth and labor and delivery as a medical condition that requires management. And I, I truly believe that both of those modalities should and can intersect at times. But that's obvious. That's, that's just the basic uh, 45 second spiel on what three different types of midwives are in the United States. <laughs> so, how does your scope of practice as a certified professional midwife differ from the other two? Very good question. A lot of people really, because it is so confusing, you're like, okay, great. So there's three different ways, but then what does that actually mean? Right. And that's wonderful. Um, And the best way I can describe that is that it will depend on what state you're practicing in, just like sure. any other provider. An example, um, you know, in Texas, which is home to me, you know, paramedics have pretty broad scopes of practice. If you go to another state, you may not have that. And it's the exact same thing with all all of the three levels of midwifery. Okay. However, we tend to have uh, certified professional midwives really gear themselves towards having low risk mamas that choose to have out of hospital birth. So we're primarily going to work in out of hospital settings in the United States. However, in Canada, they actually have hospital privileges. So it's very different from country to country and from state to state. So okay. I know it's so confusing, but med that's just how medicine is. And it's all about the states having control over, well, everything, right? Which is why <laughs> that's just how it works in the United States. Yeah. I mean, I know the most about certified nurse midwives sure. because they are APRNs, advanced practice registered nurses, because that's right. what I am. Right. Just, I'm in the, the NP side of it. Sure. And so I know they prescribe and they can diagnose. And like for my regular women's health care, I see a midwife or sometimes a women's health nurse practitioner because I just think they're awesome and I like their model of care better. Right. Can certified midwives, is that the other one? And then certified professional midwives, can they uh, prescribe? Can they diagnose? Sure. So I probably didn't, I probably didn't explain that well enough. So CMs, so certified midwives and CNMs, certified nurse midwives actually take the exact same board and are licensed by the same organization. Oh, okay. So they would be able to have the exact same scope of practice. So if you had a CM and a CNM in the same state, they wouldn't have a different scope of practice. Okay. They would be functioning the same way. So a CM would be like a PA 
to my nurse practitioner. They just have a different, their bachelor's degree was in something medical, yes. not nursing to my, right. well, I had another bachelor's degree too, but to, okay. to my nursing bachelor's as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you guys like, if you had a family practice PA and a family practice, advanced practice nurse, right? Right. They would have very, very similar scopes of practice. They just got to the end game through different paths. Gotcha. Okay. But with CPMs, it is so vastly different from state to state. In example, just my other girlfriends who happen to be CPMs in California, I am informed because <laughs> I've never worked there. So I can't, I can't say that I know for sure, but they have a really in-depth scope of practice in California. Mm-hmm. So while they don't necessarily have hospital privileges, they they do have pretty wide scope of practice. Texas is another decent decent state that has a, a wide scope of practice. We don't prescribe medications per se, but we can partner with a, we could partner with a nurse practitioner or we could partner with an MD, right? An ob and then be able to do co-care. Okay. So if I, in example, we'll just take something that's very, very basic problematic in the prenatal period, which would be a UTI. That is, yep. That's super basic and very probable through a lot of different women's pregnancy process. And, you know, I can treat that issue with lots of over the counter and herbal remedies. And then I can also say enough's enough. And it's 2019. And golly gee whiz, we're excited that there's antibiotics. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I could send my, I could send my patient to go see my partner, or maybe I share an office with him or her, and we can just be like, hey, Mary Jane's having a really hard time with this UTI. Let's just go ahead and attack. You know, we've we've sent we did a UA, it's coming back that it's bacterial. Let's just let's just nip this in the bud and we'll be over with it. And so a lot of a lot of practices will do co-care, especially birth centers. They they really focus on having co-management. So they usually have a a physician or a nurse practitioner or someone that will work with them and write those scripts when we need them, which is really great because there's also management that sometimes needs to be happening during labor and delivery. Like if a mama pops up GBS positive and she chooses to make the decision what's best for her and her baby that may incorporate antibiotic care during labor and delivery, then that is going to be implemented in labor and delivery because there would already be an order set forth for that. Okay. So I'm going to pause you on two points sure. because even in my very limited understanding of L and D, there's a couple of things I want to just explain. One GBS is group B strep, which is something that can be a concern for moms and babies, but explain to people what, what a birthing center is versus like a home. Is that sure. what you mean by out of, out of hospital birthing or are you talking home births? Yeah. So out of hospital birth is a umbrella term that will reference both birth centers and home birth. So okay. it's a, it's just an overall conglomerate. That means I'm not having a baby in a hospital. I'm having a baby outside of a hospital. And that's the umbrella term, which us in L and D tend to call out of hospital births. Gotcha. Okay. A birth center is either attached to a hospital. Um, either it doesn't have to be physically. It, I mean, in as in they are sister companies or they are they work together, right? So you can have an affiliation. I guess that's probably a better way to say that. Or you could be what's called a freestanding birth center. And a freestanding birth center would not have a monetary or physical attachment to a, another facility, i.e. a hospital. Okay. Can they do emergency C-sections at a birth, birth center? Not in the United States. Yeah. So we don't, we don't do those types of things in out of hospital settings because you want, you, you know, you, you want anesthesiologists and you want, yeah, you want an awesome yeah. surgeon with a steady hand and all that kind of stuff. So I don't, yeah, yeah birth centers do not perform cesarean sections that are freestanding. If it is a birth center that is attached to a hospital, then they just do a transfer, you know, down the hallway. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, there's outpatient surgical centers, so I wasn't right. sure if like, yeah, not at this, some of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not at this current moment in time. I I don't know. I I think that's plausible maybe in the future, but not at this current moment in time. 
Interesting. So this is not your realm, but I have this question because, so my sister, my sister was pregnant. I have this really adorable niece. She had a doula that was with her. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell is that hippie shit? What's a doula? (laughs) I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at how funny that was that you said that. What is it? I mean, at the time I was like, okay, I don't, I don't know. Does she bring a lot of candles? I imagine this woman wearing like a lot of scarves and probably mm-hmm. like a kimono or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What is this thing? Yeah, totally my school bio. I'd love to talk about doulas. Uh, so <laughs> doula is a is just a Greek word and it means woman helper. That's what that okay. word means in Greek. So a lot of people hear that word and they're just like, exactly like you said, what is this hippie shit? Um, <laughs> that's funny. Scarves and a kimono is great. That's the, that's the first I've heard that one. Normally I hear, is it going to be some mean German lady with a bunch of hairy warts on her face? I'm seriously, those are, I hear the weirdest things from people. And I'm like, why is labor and delivery so foreign to people? Like you, everyone on this planet was born. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why is everyone scared of this? <laughs> But this is a uh, doula is a really, really stinking cool thing. It's not for everyone, just like out of hospital birth isn't for everyone, but anyone. And I really believe that everyone should have a doula because just like if you, if you have a car, you have car insurance, right? And if you own a home, you have house insurance. It's because if something like the basement was to flood, you're going to call someone that knows how to deal with the flooding in the basement because that's not your area of expertise. Like you don't deal with right. house floods every day, right? But an insurance company does. And so they're going to be able to guide you through, hey, so this is how we inventory everything and this is how we're going to get you, re- you know, pay back. And I don't know, I don't speak insurance. This is just an analogy I've been using for years and it tends to work. So Essentially, a doula has a lot of experience in what normal birth looks like and what normal babies do and what sick babies do and what not so great births look like and helps you navigate this. A doula will never interfere with the partner relationship. They're just to enhance it. Because let's just be honest, if we're dealing with a heterosexual couple, they're probably men, daddies are like, I don't do this woman stuff. Like, yeah, I love her. She is my world. If anything happens to her, I will slay every dragon possible to make her be okay. But I don't really know what I'm supposed to do in these scenarios, right? Like that's right. like, th- that's just factual. Like th- th- those are things men tell me they're like, I will do whatever the heck she wants me to do. But what does that look like? And I can go, Hey, 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 go rub her back. Hey, right now, right now, what I need you to do. Don't touch her. (laughs) Don't touch her. Or, hey, what she really needs to hear from you right now is that she's a fucking rock star. So if you could go over there and whisper that into her ear, you're going to, it's going to change everything. Okay, done. Because they want this to be a momentum experience and they want to bond and grow together from being a couple, which is a family, right? But it's a different type of family into a family of three. Yeah or a three family of four or whatever you guys are going to be. And they don't know necessarily how to navigate that. So basically I just show up and during the pregnancy and the labor and delivery, right? I mean, I'm just pretending to be the doula right now. And then afterwards, and usually they stay and help out with things like breastfeeding and they help moms and dads learn how, learn how to do all the first us in L and D tend to call it like the fourth trimester. It's like navigating mm-hmm. and learning how to, what do you do with this crying thing that poops all the time? Yeah. I can imagine that a doula would be really helpful, especially like if mom has something go wrong during birth and baby needs to go to the NICU yes. and all of a sudden everyone's focusing on those two. What does dad do? Cause I've yes. had friends and, you know, patients that have said dad's just like, I don't know why everyone's rushing around all of a sudden. Right. Where do I go? Right. Who do I go with? Who stays with her? So a doula That's can, very scary. Yeah, can look at a daddy and be like, okay, um, a really good doula would actually do practice scenarios before labor and delivery happens. And then we would write things down like if a C-section was to happen or if the worst of the worst was to happen, who is staying with mom and who is going with baby? Mm. So we already talk these things out. And we, we plan and, and see that's tapping into both mom's feeling secure, right? Because we have a plan and then daddy's 
brains that are all about, I need to know exactly what to do. So again, we're back to planning, right? So it's, it's helping the family unit feel like they know what to do, even if the worst of the worst or the, I didn't plan for this to go this way type of event happens because we already, we already talked about it. Yeah. And I'm just going to say here, we're, we're talking in terms of heterosexual couples. Of course, you and I both recognize that this family structure could be oh gosh, a yes. homosexual couple that we could be using, yes. you know, two moms and two dads. But, you know, for the sake of just argument and things that people are easily recognizing, we're using, right, you know, these terms. And I've worked with those couples before or even adoptive parents. It's really yeah. great to have a doula in an adoption situation because then there is someone to be with that mom when she hands that baby over. Oh, that's a really interesting point. There's also a really wonderful way of navigating between the two. It's almost like you have a liaison, right? Because Mm. most of the time when adoptions happen in in whatever setting they happen in, they do conjoin like rooms that have a door between them and the baby goes back and forth for several hours or several days until there's, you know, proper, there's, there's time, the proper time is, is appropriate. So there's, it's a very delicate situation and having someone that knows how to navigate this and this isn't their first time. It's not to me. I think what a doula is, is very, very equivalent to what a hospice nurse does. And they guide somebody through a path that they've never been through before. However, those of us who have lost people and loved ones in our life and didn't have someone that kind of helped us as a, almost like a Sherpa, right. And moved us through this, this process have a lot of regrets. Yeah. And I wish I would have done this, or I wish I would have gotten one more picture. I wish I would have done this and see, I already know what all the special pictures are and hold the baby this way. And, you know, let's get a picture of the feet and don't forget about a picture of the hands. And and I already know these things. And so women can look back and men or women and women or whoever the, whoever the family is, right. Can, can turn around and look back and go, that was amazing. And yeah. I got everything I wanted. Cause I can't, it's like weddings, weddings, funerals, babies, you can't redo them. Yeah. They are what they are. And I want, I want whole families, not just women. And this is me wearing my midwife hat too, is I want them to walk away going, yep, that may not have gone exactly how I planned it, but it was amazing. Yeah. So I, we could keep talking about this forever <laughs> and I have a bunch of questions to follow up on that. And maybe we'll have time later on to talk about that. But sure. I want to talk about why you're called the combat midwife. What have yeah. you been doing with the military? So I started training the military in 2004. And I started out at Fort Sam Houston teaching the combat medics. So the 68 that's, whiskeys. That's where I went to training. And and were you actually in the military? No, ma'am. So I was not. Um, and everybody goes, I don't get it then. I know. I know. Hang <laughs> on. So I had an EMS background for a few years at that point and um, a pretty interesting one. And we, you know, we went to war. What is it about? What? 16 months prior to that. And so we, and I'm speaking, we as the United States, we were having a hard time um, having enough combat medics to be deployed and adequately trained because we took all of the adequately trained individuals and sent them overseas immediately. Yeah. So there was no one to train the new the new baby medics yep. <laughs> coming through Fort Sam. And there was a really cool program that was put together that basically picked the best of the best civilian wise and pulled a bunch of people together. And we trained the combat medics and did so for a very long time. In fact, civilians are still doing it to this day. Yeah. I had some great civilian instructors that were EMS professionals when I was at Fort Sam. I loved the combat medic training there. Mm -hmm. First part is EMT school, which I ended up fast tracking through because I was already an EMT. And then it's the, the actual combat medic part. And it's, it's kind of a lot of fun. It's hard. It's a lot of fun. So I taught on both sides. I taught the EMT portion and I taught the 68. I taught the actual whiskey portion. That's what we call it. Yep. Whiskey school. Yeah. And so I taught both. And then I also taught at BNOC for a while, um, which is basic non-commissioned officers school when they have to go through the their research program for mm-hmm. their 
medical portion as they're also learning all of their non-commissioned officer education. So they have to come back to Fort Sam to do that. So I taught there for a while and I absolutely loved it. Um, as one of my most favorite jobs, flight medics top, top that, but yes, it was one of my most favorite jobs ever. So were you just teaching midwifery or were you teaching kind of the general like TNCC, uh, not TNCC, TC3, which is, um, tactical combat casualty care curriculum? That's T- that would be TC4, but t- Tactical Combat Casualty Care is TC3. <laughs> so I was teaching the entire program. So as a as an instructor at the time, you didn't necessarily specialize in one particular area. You taught the whole program. So you needed to be a subject matter expert in, in all things mm-hmm. EMS at those levels. However, I at the time was going through midwifery school while I was teaching. And so, and I just have an affinity and love for everything OBGYN, neonate and peds. So (laughs) (laughs) I had a lot of people that were like, Hey, Jess, can you, can you teach this for me? And I'll swap you with whatever. And I would pick something like GI emergencies because who the heck wants to teach that or whatever, you know, like (laughs) we do a lot of swapping because nobody, nobody loves teaching that. And I do. And my sweet little baby medics uh, basically gave me that name. So it was without fail. I had class, you know, and these classes have nothing to do with each other because they're there with me for 16 weeks and then they're gone. Like, and then a new class comes in and there was just this stent of time that was like, I had a, I had class after class after class that was giving me the same nickname, which was combat midwife. They just said, you do all this combat stuff, but you're also the baby lady. (laughs) And the baby lady just doesn't sound very cool. So um, they gave me that name. It stuck. And then all of my coworkers started to call me that. Um, And it just really stuck. And I I thought, you know what? It's just going to be, it's just going to be my business name now. (laughs) You talk about the beginning of the war and the, oh my God, obviously the it's 2019. The war has been going on for over 18 years. The medics that are in whiskey school now were maybe not even born when Correct. 9-11 happened. Correct. And I remember sitting in whiskey school and this is, you know, E4 specialist Christine before okay. it was Sergeant Christine. And I remember hearing about the beginning of uh, the Iraq war in Afghanistan and they didn't have medics with every no unit or every unit that went outside the wire so every unit that would go outside the bases at the very beginning there was such a shortage that they wouldn't have them there and there was this video that they showed us of a, a unit taking fire and someone getting shot and i forget why they had video of it but this guy gets shot and they just start yelling for a medic and they real like and the realization of there's no doc there Mm -hmm. it was so heart-wrenching and you see like the interventions they're doing they're so completely wrong and amazingly the guy that got shot survived but you're just like oh shit (laughs) and Mm -hmm. it's so crazy too because as i'm sitting there in that classroom that you probably that schoolhouse that you were teaching in um, of all the instructors are like, oh, you have to learn everything because, you know, if you look up that hill, there's BAMC, which is Brook Army Medical Center, which I think is called something joint. We call it SAMC now, but I refuse to conform. <laughs> yeah. It's probably, it's like, what it <laughs> it's the San Antonio Medical Center now, but I, I refuse yeah. to conform. So the crazy thing is, and I told you this in like a text message, they always say, oh, if you look up at BAMC, SAMC, there's soldiers there that, you know, got injured in Iraq or Afghanistan. And uh, they were saved by a medic or whatever. And I'm in these big whiskey training fields, like sweating my ass off and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're trying to just motivate us. And Dan, who we just released the follow-up episode on, Dan got injured in Afghanistan in 2011 when I was in whiskey school looking up at BAMC and he was in rehab at BAMC. And it's just like this so weird thing that like eight years later, I'm interviewing him for a podcast and I'm talking to you about being an instructor there. Like I never would have thought at that time, you know, all these little weird intersections would occur. It's just such a small world. It is such a small world. It's just, it's so crazy because I've gone on and, you know, moved on with teaching the military and I see people and I'm like, oh my gosh, I know you. Or, or I have, I'll have students sometimes come up to me and like, you, you taught me in whiskey school. Like <laughs> I was a, I was a private, I'm like, okay, cool. Cause I mean, there's just, I mean, we did the math. It was funny. I'd sat down with a friend the other day. Uh, well, this was probably a couple of years ago. And I was like, how many students do you think went through when I was there? And he goes, uh, Cause he was in charge of just, um, army EMS. And he goes, 
you probably taught over 10,000 soldiers. Wow. And I, I actually got really weak in the knees and I started crying and I could probably do it now <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't join the army, but in a way I, I feel like I did, you know, like yeah, I gave a part of me that to those soldiers that left and saw horrible things and did really great things with the knowledge that I was, I'm sorry, I'm being such a girl. Um, <laughs> no, you're not being a girl. You're being a, a human. Um, it just, it's really stinking amazing that something that I said to them would have been able to stick in their brain and then in the worst situation that they would go through would be able to keep them calm and level-headed and toss their friend in the back of a UH-60 and hopefully they make it, you know, to a cash or wherever the heck they're going. Yeah, because you always say you you don't rise to the circumstances, you fall to the level of your training. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. So after you were teaching whiskeys, what did you go on to teach? Because you still teach for the military. I do. So I actually um, finished up midwifery school and I also did paramedic school through that time frame. And then um, I graduated from the University of Texas Health and Science Center and they asked me to come back and teach because they got the contract to join hands with the army to teach the flight medics, which is Mm -hmm. a whole nother, I don't know how to, I I don't know. They're crazy. It's a whole nother (laughs) MOF. They're crazy is what's going on. Yeah. So flight medics are, yeah, completely different MOS. It's almost like a additional certifications and education on top of 68 whiskey. Yeah. So MOS is a military occupational specialty. It's what your job is if you're enlisted. 68 whiskeys are EMT basics or just regular EMTs with additional specializations in trauma for things like needle chest decompression, surgical crikes, um, very trauma, trauma focused. The flight medic program is basically a paramedic program with additional like surgical skills and chest tubes and more meds and stuff and like flight medicine, critical care experience. Yeah. So they, so they go through paramedic school in six months. It's a little bit less than six months. And Which normal they, paramedic school is like two years. <laughs> yeah. So basically you get waterboarded information and then they do critical care and flight paramedics. So CCP and FPC in three months, which is stupid insane. Like it's so much information. And so they're with us and gone in just shy of what it takes to gestate a baby. <laughs> It's crazy. It's insane. How did you like doing that program? Um, so I didn't think that there would be anything on the planet that would make me happier than teaching the baby whiskeys. And then I was wrong. Um, that was a really fun, fun program. The way the army has it set up. I know it sounds like how the heck are they actually understanding all that information, but the army's really good at, at conveyor belt type stuff, like <laughs> organizing yeah. and getting things by basically taking away what do you actually need to know from this, right? Like removing the fluff, essentially. The army is very, very good at that. Mm -hmm. And I do love that because I'm one of those people like, I just need to just tell me what I actually need to know to do this. Like, don't tell me anything else. I'll figure out, like, I'll figure out the fluff later. So the army's really good at setting up programs like that. And it was really fun. It was absolutely amazing. So that was really neat because I had certain specialties by that point that were above uh, or in addition to OBGYN, neonate, and peds. And so I taught all of medical emergencies and all of special pops. So special populations includes OBGYN, neonate, and peds, uh, patients with special considerations. So those are our trach people, uh, disabilities, et cetera, geriatrics, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. So I taught those two sections primarily. And when I say taught, I mean in didactically. So in the classroom, mm-hmm. however, I had to still be able to, you know, run a bunch of people through a code or, you know, talk about flight physiology and stuff. However, yeah. those were my, those were my areas that I spent the most time in teaching. Uh, and the reason we had to do that is because there were so many students going through such a fast period. It, it, it's just, it's too much on an instructor to be able to be a jack of all trades. And so we really needed people to be experts in certain areas and really be able to again, back to remove the fluff, right? And give those yeah. individuals what they really, really need to move on from there. So it's really, it was a really cool program. And where did you go from there? So from there, um, I realized that I was just kind of 
looking at the whole, whole, everything I had done and taking stock of everything. And I went, I can't ever say goodbye to EMS or the military. Like that would break my heart into a million pieces. And I can't say goodbye to OBGYN and delivering babies. It's like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't know what to do. Like, how do I do both? Because somewhere in there, I'm supposed to sleep and eat. Like, no. how how do I do all of that? <laughs> yeah. So I realized that I love teaching. I feel like I'm good at it. My students love having me in a classroom. And I went, then I'm just going to do that. And I'm going to do it in whatever situation people need. So I get called by EMS departments or fire departments or active duty units or guard or reserve. Um, I teach at a lot of different conferences throughout the country and during the year. So I basically cater programs to whatever the heck they need. The Air Force even called and I did. I worked with their entire EOD and fire departments. Oh, that's cool. And taught the entire... Well, I kind of called it like an EMT on crack class <laughs> because they wanted EMS, like they wanted EMT basic for all of their individuals, but they also wanted them to be able to do some other things and have some other skills as they were going on a huge deployment. Oh yeah. So I catered and I can't go into all of that, but I catered, I catered what they were going to be doing there to what their education was. Um, and so I went in and in about two years worth of time, I got everybody all trained and up and ready to go. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. So I really, I've worked with almost all branches of service because it's joint forces at Fort Sam. Um, so short of working with the Marines, I've, I've covered basically all the bases. Well, the Marines don't have any medical assets. Correct. They just yeah, use that's, the Navy. Yeah. So that makes right. sense. Yeah. That's why that was, that was supposed to be funny, but yeah. if you don't know that, that's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, almost. That's also a little bit of an explanation. Sure. And and in my head, I am very much laughing at a bunch of Marines trying to learn anything about um, obstetrics. Yeah, they'd have to find pink crayons to eat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, much love to any Marine listeners there. That's a little bit of um, inter-service rivalry. <laughs> just, um, a smidge. just a I, smidge. I bleed green. <laughs> 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 Let's not talk about ASVAP scores. Um, so... <laughs> You went there, Christy. I did. Hey, I took the test. Um, (laughs) So, do you have any great stories from either midwifery or EMS or anything that you want to share, or just I don't know any cool stories from teaching? Um, I have a great story for teaching. I have a gr- I have great stories for babies. I can share a couple of my favorite ones. Yeah. So, um, a really cool. It was actually my first day teaching the flight medics. Like officially, like they always. Whenever you go somewhere new to teach, they always bring you in several months before, and you're not as officially on the books. It's just for you to get like your feet wet. Like you're going to get hired. It's just, you got to know where everything is and how to work the programs and how the heck do I make this stupid microphone work? Like just the basic stuff. Right. So it was, it was my official first day. Like I'm on the books, which by the way, happened to also be my birthday. Oh, okay. So, you know, you, you start, you get out of the bed in the morning. You're like, this is going to be a great day (laughs) because you're just, it's your birthday and it's going to be a good army day. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. You know, and and you just you're I, I just you show up to work. You're all you're all excited and everything's new. I, I'm that student like like shows up and is, is excited about the smell of new pencils. Like I, that's just the type of person. That I am. Yeah. And so I'm all excited to be at work. And they said, "Hey, we're doing skills in the big lab room. You should probably start out there this morning, and then we'll we'll get you in the classroom in the afternoon." And I was like, "That's great. That's an awesome way to start." So I walked in. And one of the other instructors said, hey, you can have that group over there. And I went, oh, this isn't going to, okay, you're just throwing me in the deep end. Fine. So I walked into the group and I sat down and and I realized, okay, so we're doing some cardiac stuff. So I had the monitor out and we're getting everything ready. When all of a sudden I realized they're just all staring at me and they're not really, it's like, it was one of those awkward situations. Yeah. And I went, okay, all right. They're going to, they know I'm the new person. So they're going to, I know how army guys and gals are. Like you are just going to berate me until you feel, realize that I'm actually one of you. And then I can stay like, that's just how this is going to go. Or just to so, straight up ignore you because I'm exactly, exhausted right. and I don't want to be here either. <laughs> right. So I looked at them and I started teaching and 
they were asking me a bunch, yeah, who are you? Where are you from? What's your experience? What have you done? Right. So I, I have to pass the test in order to stay and play with the rest of the kids in the sandbox. Right. Right. So I'm, I'm doing fine when all of a sudden this soldier leans forward and goes, are you, are you Miss Arno? And I said, <laughs> yes, I fully established that already when I walked into this cubicle and I lean forward and go, Sergeant, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. And he goes, like, like Miss Arno from Fort Sam <laughs> with just a smug look on his face. And I said, yep. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you caused me so much grief. Let's just say that I have more PTSD from you than four deployments. <laughs> like that. And I don't actually know if he's joking at this point because he's he's doing a real good job at like poker face. Yeah. So I said, you should probably be tougher than Sergeant. And he started laughing. And I went, because I'm just going, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, so many students went through that program. I don't know who this guy is. Like, I yeah. have no idea who this punk is right now. Yeah. And Welcome to the dick measuring contest of the army. That's exactly what was happening. And I pretty much won because he went, oh my God, she just called me out. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> we wind up talking and because the, the whole, the whole group, right? The other 10 of them are all all just laughing because they're like, dude, she just burned you. Right. Yeah. So now it's, now you have respect. <laughs> right. So I completely won everybody over in there where everybody's laughing. And he goes, uh, yeah, you made me sing. You, you, you made me sing. I'm a little teapot. And I went, Oh God. Okay. Okay. I know what happens here. So I had this thing and it's because you're tired and you're sleep deprived and you're hungry and you don't have anything like you, you're up at four o'clock in the morning. You're going to bed at midnight. Like that's yep. how bad Fort Sam is. It sucks. Yeah. It's a ball buster. It's brutal. And that you get marched everywhere and you're screamed at all the time and you're counting rocks and someone else is washing your lawn. It's just bad. And you're eating defect food, which is could kill an elephant. It's just horrible. Yeah. And, you know, I got to keep them awake because if they sleep and the drill sergeants come by and they find them sleeping, I'm in trouble. They're in trouble. It's just, a, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. And then you're sitting in the classroom trying to learn something and you get that nod. Right. The head bob thing. Yeah. So I tried to make it fun in the classroom. And so I had things like remote control cars in there and I had those cool paper airplanes that you could like put on a slingshot and I could like throw them at you. I just tried to make it fun because it's hot in there. It's, you know, July in Texas. It's just bad. Yeah. So. Yep. Now I'm getting flashbacks. Right. I'm sorry if you're having, <laughs> if you need to call your psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so it's just horrible. And I just tried to make it as fun as I could. And I had this baby doll that I used to sit on my podium and I would like hawk at you. So if you fell asleep, you had to stand up, hold the baby in like you were going to hold it in the crook of your arm. And if the baby fell, then you owed me 10 push-ups. Like this is just how this worked. Yeah. And so this particular sergeant had to hold the baby then he dropped the baby. So then he owed me 10 push-ups, and then he dropped the baby again. So I made him come up to the class and saying, I'm a little teapot short and stout, right? <laughs> well, the drill sergeants would make their rounds. And so you would see there's these little holes on the top of the of the doors in, <laughs> in the rooms, in the classrooms, itty bitty little tiny square holes on the top of these doors. And you would only see drill sergeant hats come bop, 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 right? And you'd hear the click, click, click of their boots. And you'd know that they're making their rounds. And what happened was, is he happened to have been singing, I'm a little teapot short and stout. And the drill sergeant peeked in there, made eye contact with me, and then nodded. And I went, oh, well, sucks to be you, dude, because you fell asleep twice, three times, actually. Well, when he when they went down to the CTA, which is just the covered training area, and yep. to do their formation to end the day, the drill sergeant called said sergeant, which was a private at the time, up to the front and said, so what did you learn today in class? And the kid is saying, you know, I learned pressure dressings and tourniquet changes and blah, blah. You know, he's like really saying, what did you learn? Like he is giving the lowdown because he does not want to get smoked in front of everyone. Yeah. And he goes, no, you didn't. Well, the drill sergeant came to my room and, you know, 
basically got the lowdown of what happened and took the baby. And so then made him like carry, hold the baby and saying, I'm a little teapot short and stout in front of the whole CTA, in front of the whole formation. So the whole platoon. And that's the story. So um, we're now really good friends, if that makes anyone feel better. (laughs) We're like very good friends now. (laughs) But that's the story. So he's like, yeah, because I had to do that, you caused me more more anguish than... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and being deployed four times to the sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> <laughs> what about any baby stories? Any birth and stories? Birth and stories. So. And on a happy birth and story. You want a happy birth? I can give you a very happy birth and story. So one of, one of my favorite <laughs> baby stories is I was actually, and so glad that we talked about what a doula is because uh, when I was a student midwife, I actually took patients as I took clients as doulas because it helped me learn, right? And it also helped families. And so this particular family uh, had their first baby with me and I was their doula, which was really cool because I basically almost delivered that baby in the... in the L and D room because the nurse didn't believe us that she was really in active labor. And I'm like, no, there's like a head coming out. And then the nurse panicked. (laughs) That's usually a good clue. Yeah. Then the nurse panicked because she was like, the doctor's not here. And so I actually delivered the baby's head and then the stinking doctor came in and delivered the rest of the baby. So, but anyway, it was really cool to help that particular family out with with their baby. Oh, that's so sweet. So their second baby, they called me and said, Hey, will you, will you deliver our, our second baby? We'd like to have a home birth. And I went, Oh yeah, sure. Cause you know, I'm, I'm done with school and I'm working with a group of midwives and et cetera. Anyway. And I went, Oh yeah, sure. That would be really fun. Um, <laughs> well, it was kind of sad because they had done one of their normal biophysical fun sonograms where they get heart looked at and liver and kidneys. And it's just kind of like check the oil, kick the tires for babies, Mm -hmm. (laughs) essentially. And there was a probability that baby was going to be born with a cardiac defect. So that is not an out of hospital birth candidate. That's no to have a baby in a hospital. So, you know, it was a little bittersweet and sad, but she said, would you still be she goes, I know you're a midwife now, but will you still be my doula? And I was like, uh, hell yeah, for sure. Aww. So I said, of course. She goes, I really want this to be as hands off and, you know, as, as natural as we did with the first baby. And I'm just hoping that we can, well, can still honor this baby, even though she may need a little extra help. And I said, of course we can do that. You know, so we picked good hospital. We picked good doctor. It was, it was a, it was a, you know, all hands on deck kind of situation. So I'm heading over to the house because she thinks she's in labor, false alarm. I head over to the house again because she thinks she's in labor, false alarm. Head over to the house again. I stay the whole weekend, false alarm. <laughs> so <laughs> the mom feels bad and I, it doesn't bother me at all. Like this doesn't actually, like, I know this about babies, like babies do their own thing. So I'm right. not stressed out about this or anything, but the family is... <laughs> The family feels bad. And all of a sudden she, it, another week or two went by and then she's like, I think I'm really in labor. I said, okay, great. So I, I rush over there and I have this rule. Not that I don't believe mommies when they say they're in labor. However, if a daddy calls, <laughs> it's legit. <laughs> <laughs> so if partner calls me, then I am like, for sure, for sure that <laughs> this is what we're dealing with now. <laughs> and he goes, Jessica, how close are you? I said, I'm actually in the neighborhood. Like I'm about to pull up. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to, I, something's happening. Okay. All right. All right. So I walk into the house. No one meets me at the door. The door's unlocked. It's late in the evening. The first little one who's now three or four is asleep on the couch. And so I tiptoe up the stairs and cause I can, I'm following the sounds if you will. Right. And they're in the bathroom and she's mad at him and you know, and then she sees me and all of a sudden she's like, Jessica, I've been waiting for you. Like it's transition. That's what's going on. Like she just is pissed at him and, and you know, another, she needs another girl at that time is really what's going on. Yeah. So I looked at him. I said, this is very normal. Remember, remember we did this with your first baby and this is transition. 
they get really antsy. Don't take it personal. We're going to be a duck in water. He goes, that's right. That's right. I remember this. I remember this. She did this before. I said, I want you to go (laughs) get the car ready. And I need you to, you know, you got to get the, you know, I can't, I'm not going to use names, but you got to get baby number one, who's now a toddler, right? Yeah. To the babysitter. Right. (laughs) Because we're leaving now. Yes. It's go time. And he goes, okay. So he takes baby number one next door to the to the neighbors because they're going to watch her. And he pulls, I can see him because we've got these beautiful picture windows in the house. So I watch him back the car out of the garage, swing it around to the front. And I'm walking mama down the stairs. And she looks at me and she goes, Jesse, I'm not going to make it. I'm not, I'm not going to make it. And I said, honey, yes, you are. This is normal. <laughs> Remember we did this. Transition just happens and you feel out of control, but you have not lost control. You are still in control. Everything's fine. And she goes, okay, okay. So we walk outside and I know no one's going to believe me, but it does get cold in Texas. <laughs> and it is, it's Thanksgiving time frame ish of the year. And so it's like that sheets of, gla- of ice coming from the heavens. Mm. It's just nasty outside and it's cold. And I've wrapped her up in a blankie and we're walking her to the car and she goes, she's here. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, what do you like? Did you water? Like, what what are we dealing? I don't know what we're dealing with here. Like, what does that mean? In transition, women's brains go into their primal brain and their articulation abilities are pretty much slim to none. So I reached down and I went, oh my God, that is a baby head. <laughs> I said, it's okay. This happens and everything's okay. And she's looked at me and she goes, are you sure? And I said, girl, I got this. So I waddled her back into the house and the dad is in the car going with his hands up like that emoji, yeah, like the hands up in the air going, what the heck are you guys doing? <laughs> and I looked at him and did the head bob of like, get your butt in this house. <laughs> you're so like holding goes, a baby head between your legs. Yes, I, I literally have a baby head in my arms. So she's crowning. So I looked at daddy and he goes, what's going on? I said, we're going to have a baby here. And he goes, but that's not the plan. I said, that happens sometimes. I'm going to need you to call 911 and I'm going to need you to go get me some towels. And he goes, okay, I only not, I'm not calling 911 because I don't know how to deliver a baby. I'm calling 911 because remember, we think that this baby has a heart defect. Right. 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 So I just want more hands on scene. Right. Okay. With a, like a monitor and IV equipment right. and a and, vehicle yeah, that all, can go through red lights if you need to. Yes. Because <laughs> I can't do all of those things and hold a baby, right? Right. Yeah. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Right. So, You're not three people. Right. Right. So he runs upstairs. He's got 911 on, on speaker and he says they're going to be here any minute. And I said, not a problem because I I'm still trying to remember. I know this sounds like it should be happening faster, but we're doing things simultaneously. Right. So I'm walking her back into the house and they have this beautiful foyer with a gorgeous piano in their foyer. And she goes, cause you, sometimes mamas get really, really weak in the knees from all the adrenaline dump that they have to have a baby. Mm-hmm. And so she's getting very wobbly. I can't hold her and hold a baby. Daddy is getting towels and he comes around the corner <laughs> and I, with my foot, I pull the piano stool close to us mm-hmm. I push her, not to be mean, but I push her to sit. And daddy is standing on the stairs and he takes this beautiful aerial shot of me pulling a baby out and bringing her up. Wow. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a beautiful picture. But it's like, I don't even know how it happened. I didn't know that I could stretch that far. I felt like the (laughs) the mom on Incredibles. (laughs) As I pull this piano stool over and push a mom to sit on it and I I push up this baby. It's just a really stinking cool picture that I have on my Instagram. It's just awesome. But yeah, so baby's fine, by the way. And it was funny because the fire department shows up and I can, again, remember those are are these picture windows that I'm sharing with you guys, but I can see the firemen walking up and they've got their OB kit and a bulb, like they got OB kit in one hand and a bulb syringe in the other. It was adorable. And I'm sad I don't have a picture of that because it was so cute. (laughs) We're we're going to suction something right now. (laughs) Yeah, they They were adorable. (laughs) and they knock on the, they knock on the door and I said, open it, open it, let them in. And he, they come in and they're like, is everything okay? I said, I got it. The baby's fine. We're doing okay. We're just going to take a nice, we'll, we'll do a POV to the hospital. And they said, oh, uh, okay. (laughs) And I looked at them and I was like, what's wrong guys? He goes, well, we just see really bad things all the time. We were excited to see a baby. And so the mom says, well, then come see her. So it was really cute. But the fireman handed me the 
the OB kit because they're like, well, do you need it? And I said, oh, God, I, yeah, I want the hat in there. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. And they helped us get her to the car. And we just had a nice slow drive to the hospital just to get baby checked out for sure, for sure. Yeah. But she was fine. And they released us later that day. And I tucked mom and baby and dad into bed in their own home. It was wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> it's so sweet. <laughs> we used to get calls all the time for like woman in labor and she's like first time mom and like contractions are like, you know, 10 minutes apart. Yeah. And you're like, this is not an emergency. You've known about this oh. for nine months. Like is, I right, know right. your OB has told you don't call for an ambulance. <laughs> like obviously if it's a high risk pregnancy and it's imminent. Yeah. That's an emergency. That's different. But like, right. come on. And you're like, we're not going licensed sirens because not an emergency. Correct. Now, imminent birth that's different <laughs> right for sure yes yes it was it was a great story so do you want to plug your instagram i know we've said combat midwife a bunch which is your instagram but you want to plug any other social media for people yeah so i'm pretty active on on instagram it happens to be my favorite platform so i do a lot on there and i would i would love it if people would follow it I, my really my goal is to really bridge the gap between the fear that the hospital providers and austere medicine which is essentially what combat medics are functioning in yeah. right mm -hmm. and bridging the gap from the fear which perpetuates things not going as smoothly as they could right, right? and so I feel really comfortable in that realm. I have a lot of experience in that realm and it's really cool to be able to share that with everyone. So my goal is to be able to either speak at conferences or come do in services as well as um, I have a really fun program where I, I do midwife Mondays. And so I either pick a topic if no one has picked one or if someone sends me a message and says, hey, Jess, can you talk about the following things. And so on Mondays, I launch either a story or a post on Instagram. Sometimes I go live if it's really detailed and can get confusing in the written word. And I just talk about those particular situations, whether it's family planning or postpartum hemorrhage or anything in between. Uh, medications, you know, what's the difference between Cytotec and Pitocin and Methergen? Like, what, is, what are those things do and why do we use them in OBGYN or uh, anything? So that, that's kind of my my thing on, on social media. And that's what I like to talk to people about. And it's really awesome because I get a lot of really good feedback on just, wow, I didn't know that or that was never explained to me that way. And now I feel more prepared if I was to ever come upon that seen or be called via 911 or be in the middle of whatever place we are overseas. And I have, you know, people of that, that area, wherever you guys are, wherever, you know, combat medics tend to be because people in the area will come to them for medical help and you never know what you're going to get. I mean, I've had lots of combat medics say I've delivered tons of babies because they come to us because yeah. we know what to do. Yeah. So when I was in my old unit, one of the guys that had been with one of the special forces units, he was, I mean, he was not an SF guy, but he was a medic and he would help the 18 Deltas who sure. were the special forces medics when they were where they were, all the locals would bring their wives to have their babies delivered by the deltas. And yes. some of them were pretty complicated because they didn't have, prenatal you know, care. they didn't have natal care. And so yeah. they delivered tons of babies when they were on that tour. And it was like, Oh, you, you don't really expect to be doing that. But all these like, tough green beret bearded dudes are like, <laughs> you know, helping people pop out babies. So it's an interesting, it it's is an interesting really crossover cool. that you don't expect that they're helping the, the local population like that. Absolutely. And there are very particular missions that some of the medics and certain units, like you were talking about like the 18 deltas, which they're always on, on weird, funky missions, but even the combat medics, will sometimes, whether it's flight or ground, will be assigned to very interesting situations. And a lot of them, I mean, you understand, but we can't always talk about them. And so they will get put in really weird places where the locals have no medicine. Like they have, yep. there's no dentist, there's no doctor, there's no midwife, there's no OB-GYN, there's nothing. 
and they will be in some really interesting positions. And so I'm very lucky that I've never had a student ever say this to me in in combat medicine or flight medicine, but they, you know, a lot of people go, I don't understand what you do, Jessica, because why would a combat medic be delivering a baby? Like, isn't that all trauma? And I'm like, nope, it's a lot of medicine. <laughs> it's a lot of everything. Yeah. It's a lot of everything. And in, in our docs, right, the 68 whiskeys or the flight medics, like there's a reason they're called doc. And it's a, it's a, it's an honor for you to reach that status because you are practicing all sorts of medicine in very, like very rural environments, very austere environments. So they have to be really good at what they do and they have to be very well versed. So yes, while there is trauma and who doesn't love a good trauma wound, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of medicine. I mean, you know, even just the taking care of your own female soldiers, you know, ovarian cysts can happen. Yeah. Ovarian torsion can happen. Uh, uterine fibroids could happen. I right. mean, um, females have extra parts and they can go wonky and you've got to be able to know how to navigate that. Yeah. And so these men and women are very, very receptive to gaining this education. And I think I'm very honored. I'm very honored, one, to be able to provide it. And two, I'm, I'm super blessed to be able to hang out with really amazing people that I love it because they they are no longer my students. And then I get to call them friends. <laughs> yeah, the, especially the military medical units that are not just units, um, not just medics attached to combat units, but actual medical units. They will go into right. humanitarian missions uh, very frequently in places like Africa and, mm -hmm. and they're alone. So you may be doing whatever that location needs. And it's part Absolutely. of some overall big military thing. Mission. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah. And people don't know that we do a lot of humanitarian work around the world. And just talking about the doc thing, I was in my primary care practice probably last year and this guy who had been an infantry guy came in for a pretty, he was pretty sick and I was going through, you know, his symptoms and I was doing his exam and stuff. And I said, just chatting with him, I was like, oh yeah, you know, I was in the army and you know, I was a medic, I'm, I was in the reserves or whatever. And he was like, oh, that's so cool. Even though he's really sick and or I was waving to him as he was leaving after we had this whole plan and imaging and labs and come see me next week. We're checking in on this. We'll go over your results and, and go from there. He goes, thanks, doc. And of course, I'm working with all these doctors and people are like, she's the nurse practitioner. I was like, no, this is different. This is a sign it's of respect. Different. And it was, it is. It was, I mean, I, I kind of got choked up. I was like, oh, that's so like, that's so nice to like to have that sign of respect and people don't understand it if you haven't been there. Right. It, it It's an honor. And, and not everyone that is a 68 whiskey or a flight medic will be called that, right? Like it's your or, unit. It, yeah. Your unit gives it to you based off what you just said, which is you have to earn it. And it's, it's just, a, I don't know. I'm all, I'm all choked up. I don't have words for it because <laughs> it's, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would not be called that, but, the, but my students do. And that's, and I play a tiny part in that. And I, yeah. I feel very honored. Yeah. People think of the military a lot of times as going out there and killing people. And there's a lot of you know, controversy about that. But, you know, your job as a medic is to make sure that people come home and you treat everybody. Right. And it doesn't, right. yeah, you're a soldier and your job is to protect yourself and to protect your patients. But when you're a medic, you join so that you make sure people come home. And that's, that's your job. And your job was to make sure that we could complete that mission. So yeah, thank you so much for, for training us and, and taking the time to speak with me today about what you do. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's absolutely my, pre ple my pleasure. It was super fun. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. I'm glad we got to eventually do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I tell my, I teach a lot of online classes sometimes, and it's just so funny. I, I go, me being a teacher, not funny. Me being an online teacher, freaking hysterical, because I should not touch any of this stuff. <laughs> Well, if anyone wants to follow me on social media, the podcast is Antidotes Podcast on Instagram. Twitter is Antidotes Pod. Of course, there is Facebook, Antidotes Stories in Medicine. And you can always reach me at antidotespodcast at gmail.com. Thank you again to fellow Army combat medic who has actually done some real shit, Peter Hopkins, who has created and designed all of our amazing custom music. You can always find him on his social media, which is in our show notes. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I will see you next time. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>